How's it going everyone? Welcome to the channel. I promised a horde guide, I think, a couple of months ago. So I'm finally coming through on my word. Also, a guide on hordes has been requested a few times. And so I thought, what better horde to play than the Great Horde? Playing as a horde is a different experience compared to the usual monarchies. There is a certain playstyle for playing horde. And that playstyle is being aggressive. Like, really aggressive. So if you're used to playing a laid back game, you should definitely try playing as Horde. It will teach you how to be at war all the time. Because as a Horde, if you are not at war, you aren't playing as Hordes are supposed to be played. And you will also learn how to manage your economy better. For newer players who have never played as a Horde, let's quickly go over some game mechanics that are unique to them. Since we are talking about the Great Horde here, let's discuss the Step Nomad bonuses. Step Nomad is the government type for Great Horde. With this government, we get bonuses to manpower, land force limit, movement speed, reinforced cost, looting speed, minus 5 years of separatism, and plus 25% cavalry to infantry ratio. All those are some really powerful military bonuses. We also get minus 15% institution spread though, which isn't great and means we will likely pay institution penalty on tech a lot. But that extra cost is more than compensated by the raising mechanic. As a horde, we can raise a province. It can be done on a province we own, but not cord yet. And you should do this after every war. Raise the province, and then core it. It depletes the development of that province, which means now it costs less admin to core and generates less ore extension, while giving you some monarch points and ducats. You can get so many monarch points from raising that you will never be short on them in game. Raising a province also increases horde unity and you will want it to be high at all times. Low horde unity gives national unrest and discipline malice while spawning a lot of rebels. You also get horde unity by raising and looting, which means you need to be at war a lot. Also higher power projection gives extra horde unity, which again means more wars. So you can probably tell, hordes are meant to be played aggressively. And one of the biggest bonuses to offense as a horde is the 25% extra shock damage on provinces that are plain, such as steppes or grasslands. Always keep this in mind. Sometimes even taking a defensive fight in a rough terrain isn't worth it as a horde. You should always try to fight in plain provinces. And because of this shock damage bonus and the increased cavalry to infantry ratio, it's desirable to have more cavalry in your army. I would go with say 5 infantry, 13 to 14 cavalry and a backline of cannons once you hit tech 7. Step nomads also have just one estate, the tribes. And they are the worst. With some of the worst events. Be prepared for a lot of stability hits. And that was some of the basics of horde mechanics and that should give you an idea on what to expect when playing as a horde. Now let's take a look at the Great Horde. They can be a powerhouse if played right. They have a lot of military advantage over the neighbors, which means easier early wars. Plus, Great Horde starts at the confluence of Sunni, Orthodox, and Catholic worlds, which means you can rotate your expansion routes between them and accrue minimal aggressive expansion. One of the major challenges you will face playing as Great Horde is the economy. The provinces that you have aren't very profitable and when you conquer new provinces, you will raise them, which means they won't be producing as much money either. And the same goes for trade. Great Horde doesn't have a good trade node to draw a lot of money from, at least till mid game. Once you take over Persia node and move towards India, it gets better, but only marginally. Your main source of income most of the game is going to be wars, which again goes well with our aggressive play strategy. You should always take all the money you can from your enemy. Playing as a horde, the obvious first target is forming the Golden Horde. To form the Golden Horde, we need some provinces. Couple of them from Uzbek, a province from Kazan and Nogai, couple of provinces from Crimea, and a few provinces from Muscovy and its subjects. There's also an achievement called Gold Rush, which you can get if you form Golden Horde before 1500. So let's look at how we can make that happen. There are two main hurdles you will face. One is Muscovy and its minions. They are strong and they have way more troops than you at the start. 
and second is Crimea. An event can turn Crimea into Ottomans vassal or march, and you really don't want to fight the Ottomans this early. The event is RNG, but it doesn't fire if Crimea is at war. Starting as Great Horde, you need to identify targets early because you have to be at war almost constantly. The exact sequence of wars at the start will depend on the diplomacy around you. So to see it better, let's see how my run progressed. Great Horde is surrounded by a lot of nations, and so first we should look around and see who is a good target. Remember, you need to be at war almost all the time, so start looking for targets early December. First of all, Circassia. You don't need to attack Circassia just yet, as we don't need any provinces from them to form the Golden Horde. In my game, they were willing to be my tributary, so I made them one. I also needed an ally. I was basically going to declare on all my neighbors soon, so I couldn't ally them. I decided to ally Uzbek instead. This was just a short-term alliance to protect myself from aggression. Unfortunately in my game, Crimea managed to ally Ottomans within the first few days. By the way, you should also start improving relations with Ottomans. They are a very good defensive ally. After a few days, I noticed that Kazan had allied Crimea as well. This was good news. Now I could attack Kazan and use this war to break Crimea's alliance with Ottomans. The other neighbor Nogai was allied to Uzbek, which was unfortunate. Muscovy has way too many troops at the start, so we will wait till they declare on Novgorod. Lithuania is allied to Poland and will likely become their PU subject soon, so that's a no-go. Then I saw that Ryazan, the three province minor, did not have any allies. So obviously that was going to be the first target. Sometimes they might be allied to Tver, which isn't a big deal either. In preparation for war, we will use the tribe estate to raise host, which gives us a general and some cavalry units. As a horde, we also get CB on all our neighbors, which is really convenient. It also gives us 75% A, which is again very helpful. So I declared on Ryzen straight away. I got lucky with the general rolls and got a 3311 general. A high shock general is very important here as your army will have mostly cavalry who have more shock damage than fire damage, plus fighting in planes gives us even more shock damage. This war was very easy obviously and I full annex Ryzen in a couple of years. Remember to raise the province and then court them. Next it was time to take care of Crimea. Crimea event hadn't fired yet so I was hoping it doesn't fire. I went ahead and declared on Kazan anyways. Uzbek was willing to join with Promise of Land, which was good. I broke the Crimean Ottoman alliance and pieced Crimea out. Then I took all the provinces I could from Kazan along with all their money. Make sure you get the province of Kazan in this war as we needed to form the Golden Horde. Again, raise province, then core them. This gives us enough provinces to complete a mission as we have already conquered Ryzen, and now we have a lot more claims in Muscovy and its little vassals. In my game, right after this, Poland decided to attack Crimea, and soon Circassia joined as well. It was a free real estate for everyone kind of deal, while I had a truce with them. Very unfortunate, but we can't do anything about it. On the bright side, I was able to ally Ottomans now, which was great. Finally, Muscovy attacked Novgorod, so it was time to take them on. The war is long and not as easy. You can use the tribal superiority CB here as well. It gives ticking war score if you win battles. So although they have way more combined troops than you, the AI isn't good about grouping them up. So I was always looking to fight a small stack here and there while sieging their capital when possible. In the end, I managed to take some money. I also took their capital of Moscow. I wouldn't advise to wait for 100% war score in the first war as you will be suffering from low manpower. Taking Moscow gave me borders with Tver, so I attacked them next, and full annexed them. Next, it was time to take on Nogai, when I noticed that Uzbek was busy with rebels and would not answer their call to arms. I was still low on manpower and had some rebel issues, so I decided to just take all their money and a couple of provinces including the province of Nogai, which is needed to form the Golden Horde. While I was busy expanding my borders, Crimea has been divided between Moldavia, who was a Polish vassal, and Circassia. But RNG was on my side this time, as Crimea now had the only two provinces that are needed to form Golden Horde. That was really lucky. So I declared on poor Crimea. It was a quick war, but I couldn't take their capital as I couldn't core it. So I vassalized them instead. After this, I got three successive tribe events with stability hits, 
which brought my stability to minus 3. Oh how I love tribes. But at least I had a decent 3-3-4 king and a very good 6-5-5 air. I was just hoping for no hunting accidents. Ottomans called me to war after this which I happily accepted. They also decided to give me some money as I already had a few loans. This war was wrapped up quickly and soon it was time to attack Muscovy once more. When they were fighting Novgorod, the strategy was the same. Fight the smallest tanks and siege down what you can. After 4 years of this, I managed to get all their money and a few provinces. Even after this, I was 700 ducats in debt. Like I mentioned earlier, be prepared to be in debt all the time and make sure you take money from wars. You will also need to spend some admin points on buying down inflation from time to time. After this, I decided to use my vassal Crimea's Reconquest CB on Circassia. I also decided to end my Uzbek alliance now as I was going to attack them fairly soon. The Circassian war was easy and I divided them between Crimea and myself. Next was Nogai again. They had taken some provinces from Kazan and then Uzbek had taken some provinces from them. Nogai were small enough so I full annexed them while the tribe events were making my life as hard as possible. I finished up Kazan quickly in a war and just like that I was a great power in 1473. Not a bad start. Finally my truce with Uzbek was over so I declared on them. I just needed two provinces from them to form the Golden Horde so I took all their money and those provinces. Ottomans took a pity on my poor finances and decided to give me 6 ducats per month in subsidies. Thanks to that, I was finally making money for the first time. Next I attacked Muscovy again, this time just for some money as I didn't want the war to drag on for too long. I had some loans to pay off. So between the subsidies and the war reps, I was finally making some good money. In this time, I was also integrating Crimea as I needed to own the two provinces to form the Golden Horde. And finally in 1487, I was able to reform the Golden Horde. Apart from the nice rich golden color, the government rank changes to empire, which means all cultures in the Tatar group are accepted, meaning less unrest, less rebels and more money. All good things. We also get new ideas which are really nice and some new claims on our neighbors. This is a pretty aggressive start and will ensure you get the golden rush achievement. However, the finances do take a hit, as I was 2000 ducats in debt by this time. It's not looking great, but it's very far from any risk of bankruptcy, so I was okay with it. Tech-wise, I was concentrating on military obviously, and since we cored so many provinces, my admin tech was suffering. I was still at level 3 admin tech. I had level 6 diplotech and level 7 military tech. So at this time, I switched the focus to admin points generation to catch up on admin tech and get an idea group going soon. I was waiting for the Shadow Kingdom event to fire so I could attack Genoa as now they won't be protected by the Emperor. So that's what I did and called in Ottomans. It was a quick war. It also completes a mission and gives some claims in Lithuania. Keeping true to my province of Constanty being at war, I attacked Muscovy again. This time the war was easier as I had a military tech advantage on them. I took all their money and some provinces for max war score. Now it was time to make use of my strong ally. So I attacked Lithuania next and called in Ottomans. After a long war, I managed to take all their money and a lot of provinces. I also gave a province to Ottomans to keep them happy. Next, I attacked Uzbek again and took most of their provinces. I wanted to neighbor Timurid soon as I wanted to expand in the Persia node and eventually to India. In my game, Timurids did not lose any vassals and were really strong. I wanted to keep rotating my conquest to keep the AE in check. So I took my armies back north to Muscovy and took some provinces from them along with their money. This was when I noticed that Poland and Lithuania were having some serious troubles. They had a lot of rebels and were getting attacked by both Brandenburg and Bohemia. So naturally I decided to join the party. Poland actually had zero troops and the war was mostly just trying not to walk into one of the many rebel stacks. During the course of this war, a couple of rebel separatists succeeded and defected from Poland and Lithuania and more would follow soon. I had some rebel issues of my own by the way. Be prepared to fight rebels most of the early game. There really is no way around it. You can increase autonomy but the rebels will fire anyways. From the Polish war, I managed to take 100 war score worth provinces and ducats. So it was only 1525 and the Golden Horde had its nudely appendages in a lot of different nations. 
I attacked one of the newly formed nations of Galicia, Walhini annexed and full annexed them. The AE was still not bad. Then I realized that Muscovy had allied Timurids, which was really bad news for me, as I wanted to fight them both, but definitely not together. Luckily, Muscovy had also guaranteed Livonian order, so I attacked Livonian order instead. I pieced out Muscovy with all their money and broke their alliance with Timurids. Then I took all provinces I could from Livonian order, and here's 1542 Golden Horde. Very expansive, but more importantly, neighboring a lot of nations, which meant I could keep the constant warfare going. That's when I noticed Timurids were fighting Delhi and some big Indian nations, so it was finally time to attack Timurids. Ottomans were proving to be useless offensively though. I figured I could take them on my own. I had a 3C general and some powerful horde cavalry. They outnumbered me, but my cavalry and general were just too good. I took all their money and the provinces I had claims on. The final battle tally was my one troop for their two, which is pretty impressive. This completed a mission and gave me more claims on Timurids. As soon as I finished the Timurids wars, Ottomans called me into another one. They won't join my offensive wars, but they could call me into wars that are not near me, even though it's an offensive war, which is weird. So I had to go fight Mamluks now. By the way, the aggressive expansion still looked very manageable. During the Mamluks war, I noticed a unicorn. AI had formed a huge Tripoli somehow. Meanwhile, England was not having a good game at all. Getting back to our rightful land, I attacked Muscovy again and took some more money and more provinces from them. Timurids were at war with Delhi again, so it was time for the second Timurids war. I took all their money and a lot of provinces I had claims on, and this time the battle stats were even better. My one troop died for their five. That right there is the true power of Horde Cavalry. I had completed the government reforms at this point. You can choose the last reform and become a monarchy or republic or theocracy. It's really up to you how you want to play it. But if you are looking to play a full expansion game, you should stay as a Horde. The military bonuses along with raising mechanic is really overpowered. I also did not have manpower issues in this game except for the very start. The Horde government along with Golden Horde ideas give you a lot of manpower. My manpower was recovering almost 1000 per month in 1573. That is insanely good. It was time to attack Muscovy again, especially since now I had a 5 seat general, which meant quicker wars. Since we are fighting so much, the army tradition stays up. I had mine between 90 and 100 almost all the time, which meant really overpowered generals and easier wars. I had a few tributaries too. I also made Poland as a tributary just because I could. I also had Kasikumuk as a tributary. And I haven't really expanded into the Caucasus region even though we get claims there. I wanted to expand there now, so I cancelled that tributary and waited for the truce to expire. In the meantime, Hungary was all alone, so I gave him some company. And while I was in Europe, I decided to tend to Lithuania once more. I fully intended to use my 5C general as much as I could. I took all of Lithuania's money and a lot of provinces, mostly to straighten out the borders. And the AE was still not too bad. I still had a lot of rebel issues though. By the way, a little trick with this, if you kill the rebels, you don't need to wait around to unseize the provinces. Your tributaries will do that for you, which is really handy and saves a lot of time. I decided to swing around to Timurids again as their ally Jeanpur was busy with another war. They would still join in, but at least they would be a bit weaker. I decided to take just all their money from this war. My financial situation was pretty dire at this point and Timurids were rich, so I hatched a plan. Once I ended this war, taking just a ton of money, I declared on Gazikumuk the same day I pieced out Timurids. I wanted to fight Gazikumuk earlier, but they had allied Ottomans and were guaranteed by Timurids. However, now Ottomans were busy in another war and would not join in, while Timurids would again join the war. And that was the reason I wanted to piece out Timurids in the previous war quickly. If Timurids had suffered too many losses, they would not have joined this war. And all I wanted from this war was just more money. I managed to take the exact amount of money I had taken just a year ago, and this war was even easier as Timurids were still recovering from the last war. And thanks to that 4,000 ducats donation from the Timurids Foundation within a year, 
now I only had 2,500 ducats in loans. I was still losing a lot of money, but at least I wasn't going to go bankrupt. From Gazikumuk, I took as many provinces as I could. Then I attacked Muscovy once more when they were busy fighting Sweden. It was an easy war, but look at that rebels list on the right. Yeah, I was constantly overextended and had some rebel issues. Just as I finished that war, the weirdest thing happened. Denmark decided to declare war on me. It was just Denmark against me and Ottomans. AI in the current patch does some weird stuff. I just let Ottomans take care of Denmark while I was busy doing some rebel suppression. From Denmark, I took some Scandinavian provinces and released Norway as my vassal, who had courts on Denmark and Sweden, which I could use for reconquests. Since I was in Caucasus now, I wanted to take more provinces there before Ottomans or Timurids get a chance. So I attacked Soran, who only had a couple of minor allies. Seems like a very straightforward war, right? Especially since I still had the 5 siege general. But RNG had other plans for me. Almost every siege went up to 70% and the war dragged on forever. Finally, I was able to finish it. I decided to vassalize Mushasha, as they had some cores on Timurids, which will help me in future wars. Then I took as much as I could in the Caucasus region. While I was there, I decided to say hello to my new neighbor Georgia, and they liked me so much they decided to join my nation. The aggressive expansion was still okay. Like I mentioned earlier, A isn't really a limiting factor when playing as Great Horde. At this point, Ottomans decided they didn't like me anymore. They dissolved my alliance and rivaled me. I actually did not see this coming, and I was left scrambling to get some alliances going. I managed to finally ally Jeanpur and Mamluks and was improving relations with Spain. The good thing was that Timurids had rivaled Ottomans earlier, and that was lucky, because if Ottomans and Timurids joined forces, it would create a tough situation for me. Next, I decided to finally take care of Ming by attacking Oirat. Both Oirat and Ming were military tech 14, while I was at military tech 17, which is a huge advantage. So I declared on them. I had a big morale advantage on Ming, but they had better discipline. After fighting countless battles, I finally managed to piece out Bing for some money. I would have loved to take more, but frankly I just got tired of microing my army around. And then from Oirat, I took all their money and provinces that would give me a border with Ming. And that's how you defeat Ming. As a step nomad, once the truce is over, Ming will get the unguarded frontier disaster, and that's when you attack them and keep fighting till their mandate is gone. After that, it's just picking up pieces and expanding in China. So after all that, I only had one loan, just 600 ducats. I'm still losing money of course, but I only have one loan. And this is how you actually play as Horde. Don't worry about income, just keep attacking bigger nations and take money from them. I probably took close to 10,000 ducats just from Timurids. So in 1616, I decided to stop playing. If I wanted to play more, I would have finished off Muscovy or maybe made them my tributary attacked Sweden with Norway's CB, eventually allied Spain and took on Ottomans, and Timurids really won't be an issue either as they are in a lot of debt, thanks to me. And after that, it's just expanding in China and India and forming trade companies, and eventually forming Mongol Empire if you want to. The main reason I didn't play longer is that the current 1.28 patch has a confirmed bug which makes the game stutter after forming trade companies, which would be annoying to play with. One of the other things you should keep in mind is that if you want to form the Mongol Empire, remember that your capital will move to Asia, which means if you have any trade companies, they will go away. And all your current provinces that are part of the trade companies will be regular provinces with a lot of unrest and negative modifier for leaving trade company. So if you're this big with 200 years of game time to go, you can easily do a world conquest, especially if you stay as a horde. The economy gets better once you establish the trade companies and take over rich Ottomans and European provinces. Next, let's take a look at the ideas you might want to take as a horde. You can never go wrong opening with aristocratic ideas as horde. Cavalry compatibility is obviously great, along with the other ideas in there. Plus, you can also enact policies that gives extra horde unity. In my game, I went with trade as the second idea group, I wanted to see if trade ideas will make any difference to my economy. And it really did not. Just don't take trade. This is my trade income after completing the trade idea group. For second idea group, 
either go Diplo for that reduced war score cost, or if you can spare admin, take Humanist. Because you will need Humanist sooner rather than later. The rebels are really annoying. After that, you can take another military idea, offensive or defensive are good, then go for economic ideas, as that will help with inflation and give your economy some much needed boost. And after that, that's really how you want to play. You could take admin idea group, that's always nice, or go for another military one. And that was my quick guide on how to play as Great Horde. Playing as Great Horde, you can actually get quite a few achievements too. Gold Rush, we already discussed farming the Golden Horde before 1500. You can also get the Great Khan, which needs you to own all provinces in Russian, Persian and Chinese regions. I'll graze my horse here and here, where you need to own 200 livestock or grain provinces. Pyramids of Skulls, where you need to raise a 30 dev province. It can be done when conquering one of Ming's provinces or Constantinople. And Turning the Tide, where you need to embrace all institutions as a steppe nomad. So basically, if you start as Great Horde and play till say 1750, you will be able to get all those achievements by just playing normally. Playing as a Horde is a lot of fun. The gameplay is quite different and you are forced to play a certain playstyle. The tribe stability hits and heirs dying events are pretty bad, but the military bonuses and the monarch point generation from raising more than makes up for it. Hopefully this guide will help you get some of those achievements playing as Great Horde. Let me know how your game goes in the comments, or you can join my Discord channel and share your game there with all of us. You are watching a Radio Rest Guide, thanks for your time, and I'll see you all in the next one.